Welcome to another chilling episode of STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. In today's episode, we are going to be chewing out and at the end of the episode, you're going to find you're not going to need to go to the shop for an ice cream like this because you will know how to make your own ice cream. So sit back, relax and watch how to chill out and make ice cream. Today we're going to make ice cream in a bag. You'll need a few things to start. You need some ice, two Ziploc bags, one bigger than the other, some cream or full cream milk, some just regular table salt, vanilla or vanilla essence, and quarter to half a cup of sugar, depending on how sweet you like it. To start with, we're going to put in some vanilla, about a teaspoon. And then the sugar. And then about half of one of these or a cup of milk. And zip the bag up as tight as you can without any air in. The easiest way is to three quarter zip it along and then squash the air out at the end. And then give that a mix around, stir in the sugar, stir in the vanilla, give it a good mix. Then we're gonna add our ice to the bigger bag. And so it activates better and stays really cold, just gotta put a bit of salt in there. And then our bag of what will be ice cream and top it up with ice. And again, the more air you get out of the bag, the better. And now we're ready to make our ice cream. So this is now going to involve five to 10 minutes of constant shaking to get that cream or milk to turn into ice cream.
I've been shaking it for nearly 10 minutes now. I might open it up and see what it's like. It's hardened up nicely. And tastes really great. I would definitely recommend you should give this experiment a try at home. Well worth it. A deadly episode of Word of the Day. And today's Word of the Day is... Pura, meaning hill or rock. Have a go at saying Pura. And we'll see you mob next time. Bye! Bye. A Pura. You're working at the shop and the boss shows up and gives you a new job to do. He asks you to rearrange and repack the groceries that have been shuffled by the customers to make them look pretty. As he leaves, you get to work. You start packing and you start stacking, not necessarily in any particular way, but you soon realize that things aren't going according to plan. The boxes aren't staying on top of each other and everything is starting to be very wobbly and falls over. You're not exactly sure how to do it, so you try again. This time, packing the boxes more on the ground and less on top of each other. But when you try to stack, they keep falling over and you just can't get it right. Welcome to episode 7 of Marcus and his mates, Marcus Packs Shelves. Well, Marcus has been on quite an exciting journey with his Uncle Dan. He's learned a lot of things, and last week he was just learning about how to give customers the correct change. That was a challenge. Now this week, Marcus and his uncle are heading to the Walrus store in Minieri. Now, the day started out just like any other and Uncle Dan was starting to set up the shop to begin trading. He had decided that Marcus had learned a lot of things, so he left Marcus to do his own work in his office. Uncle Dan, though, had just received a large shipment of supplies, and those supplies he needed to pack on some empty shelves. Now, Marcus was in Uncle Dan's office, remembering all what that he had learned about plussing and giving customers change, when Uncle Dan thought that he would teach Marcus something new about packing shelves and about shapes. Then, Uncle Dan decided to call Marcus, and in that call, he explained that he wanted to teach him something new and he needed Marcus to come over to the front of the shop so that he could show him what responsibility Marcus needed to do. So, Marcus arrived to the big empty shelves and Uncle Dan showed him the many bags that were stacked near them. He mentioned that they have supplies that need to go on the shelves so customers could buy them and he wanted Marcus to pack them properly on the shelf. But he wasn't gonna tell him how, he wanted Marcus to figure it out. Well, Dan then left Marcus to pack the shelves by himself. Oh, 
Hi guys, welcome back. Today we're looking at three dimensional shapes. Remember our 3D shapes? They have length, they have width, and they have height. So that's three different things that we can measure. So any 3D shape, it could be a rectangular prism, we can measure the length, the width, and the height. It could be a very specialised rectangular prism, which is called a cube. And the reason it's special is because the length, the width, and the height are all the same, which makes it a cube. Now, if we were going to measure this box of jets, we would measure across here for the length, then we'd measure the height of the box, and then this is the depth. And that's why it's three-dimensional, because it's anything that you can pick up. If you have a look around in your community, I'm sure you will find lots of these shapes. For example, who likes an ice cream cone? I do. Do you have a soccer ball? It would, be, it would look like a sphere. A rectangular prism is any kind of box. So have a look around, send us some photos. Maybe do some measurements even and see if you can give us the sizes of your containers. Well, that's all for now. See you next time. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Welcome to another Clontarf segment on Urara TE. Today we're going to look at volunteering. Volunteering is when someone offers their services or help without getting paid for it. Some people volunteer to help raise money for charities, some volunteer to help around their community, and others volunteer to help run sporting clubs. So why would someone offer to do some work without getting paid for it? Let's ask someone who volunteers. We had Miss Pat from the front desk at Urara College with us. And Miss Pat has done a lot of volunteering. Can you tell us some of the volunteer duties you've performed, Miss Pat? Well, I've been a timekeeper for motorbikes and the cars at Speedway. I've also done, uh, been a race secretary at the Alice Springs Off-Road Club. I've also volunteered in the canteen down there. I've also been a sweep vehicle at Fink for the Fink Desert Race. And I've been a Cub Scout leader. Why, why did you volunteer your services uh, to do those duties? Well, first off, someone was required at the time, but also you get a lot of pleasure out of helping other people. I was going to ask, you don't get money, what do you get out of it? Well, I've learnt things. I've learnt um, a lot about Speedway and uh, a lot about off-road, and I've learned a lot about uh, Cubs and people how, helping people so you get you get you learn things and you also help people to do things themselves has there been some family involvement in those activities yes my husband and both my daughters have driven speedway and my husband when we moved up here from Adelaide and then my daughters from the age of 11 to 17 both drove speedway they've also my husband's also had an off-road buggy so they've done think and with his buggy and with other buggies and um, my daughters have both been Cub Scouts, so that's when I got joined Cub Scouts. So there's a satisfaction of helping out the family too. You did mention the Fink Desert, uh, Fink Desert Race. Uh, that would be one of the biggest volunteer events anywhere in the country, and it's certainly one of Central Australia's biggest events. Absolutely. There are hundreds of volunteers for that. And uh, when you volunteer, you're a small cog in a big machine, but it makes you feel really good when it's all over and everything's gone to plan. Miss Pat, thank you for volunteering to be a part of our video and thank you for the volunteering you've been doing around Central Australia. Thank you. Volunteering might also be helpful for you to gain experience that could eventually lead to employment. Let's talk to Mr Will from the Arara College Pathways team about this. Hey Stan, uh, it can definitely help out with um, getting a career. Um, first off, when you have a resume, uh, well to be able to get a job you need to have a resume. And on that resume, if you, if you have a space of time, period of time, one year or two years, and if you haven't done any work or volunteering in that time, the employer will actually will not like that. Um, so if you finish school uh, and then you have two years of doing nothing, it's, it's not good. 
But if you've actually volunteered during that time, like I volunteer at my church, um, I've done a lot of volunteering in the past, um, it shows you shows the employer that you've actually been busy, you haven't just been sitting around doing nothing, and you're also gaining skills. So if you're at a community or wherever you are, um, you can volunteer in your sports clubs, your sports, uh, or you know, any kind of sporting thing that you can do. You can volunteer at your local uh, shop or even being a chef. And during this time, you're gonna be gaining skills that will help you get an employment in the future. Yeah, employers really like community-minded uh, employees because it, it obviously is good for everyone in that community, not just the employer, and it creates relationships and rapport, which is very important. I've done some volunteering that has led to employment. Some of you may know that I do a bit of footy commentating on the TV and radio, and I get paid for that. But first up, I got into that sort of work by volunteering to do some media promotion for my local footy league in Darwin. Volunteering is especially important for those of you who love playing organised sport. All local sporting clubs rely on a committee of volunteers to operate. Some of you might play for a bush footy team that doesn't have a committee, but you do have coaches, and those coaches are volunteers too. They don't get paid, and they put in plenty of their own time to make sure your community gets a team out on the park. So volunteers are an important part of any community. Without volunteers, lots of good things that happen in the community might not happen. What's up your fam, it's Tina here and you're back with another exciting episode of Your Hour to You. So for today, we're talking all things negative space. I'm not talking about that space, I'm talking about the space all around. Well, not this type of around, but you get the picture. So let's head back and I'll let you know what we're going to need for today's lesson. That's better. So for today, Miss Priscilla is using watercolours, but you can use any colours. You can use pencil colours, you can use crayons, whatever it is, because we're going to be using space around the drawing. So let's go find Miss Priscilla and let's get drawing. Okay, so to start our negative painting today, we're just going to trace a picture of an animal. Uh, I've chosen a horse and we're just going to paint around that animal. Uh, very lightly in watercolour. Uh, I've just chosen to use shades of blue, so we're just going to stick to the one shade and to make it darker we're going to be layering the colour on top. So before I do my second layer, I've just traced another picture of a horse behind. And now I'm going to paint around both of those horses. So remember, negative painting is just painting the space around the outside of the object, not painting the object itself. And then we can start to build up the colour. So now I'm going to do some mountains. The mountain range furthest away in the distance is going to be lighter so I'm just doing one layer over the top and then I'm going to build it up by doing more layers in the foreground 
at the front. So I can start to go darker as I'm working towards the front. I'm changing my brush to a slightly finer tip just to get as close as I can. You can start to see the image of the horse start to pop out. So I suggest first of all that you go onto the internet and find a picture of an animal that you can trace. And then if you have access to watercolour paints, you can just paint that area around the outside of your object or animal. If you don't have access to watercolour paints, you can use pencils, that's fine. But just concentrate on the area or space around your traced image. So my mountains at the front, you can see they're nice and dark. And there is my negative painting. Today, our persuasive writing topic is I need more pocket money while I am at Urara. What would be your reasons for wanting more pocket money? How would you word it in a text or if you're talking on the phone? Here are some suggestions. I want to have more spending money at shopping. It would be good to have more spending money. Maybe I could buy more shoes if I want them. I would have better fun if I could buy more things. Now those statements are what we would call weak because they don't really state a very strong reason. Let's look at some other statements. I need the right money to be able to buy proper clothes. It would be great to be able to buy more runners when my old ones get too tight. It is important that I am able to buy what I need for school. So these are stronger statements that are more convincing. I asked some staff members what they would have said if they were asking family to send them some money while they were away at boarding school. Please, can I have some more money? I promise to be good. Do you really think that family would believe you if you said that you're going to be good? For how long? Until you received the money? Until you found something else that you wanted, even if you didn't really need it? Can I please, please have some money? I want to buy my best friend a present. Well, if family really know your friend, they may be happy to do so, especially if they could understand that your friend, like Miss Anne-Marie, really needs something. I need some more pocket money uh, because it's winter and I need to go and get some more jumpers. It's getting cold. Yes, Miss Anne-Marie really needs more money for warm clothes. Now let's see what Miss Leanne needs. I need some more money for phone calls. I want more pocket money so I can buy lots of snacks to share with my friends. Now, Miss Rebecca, she's just really talking about a want, not a need. How many snacks is she planning on buying? And for how many of her friends is she planning on buying them? And for how long? No, she hasn't really stated a real need. As we learn more about persuasive writing over the next two weeks, you're going to recognise the importance of carefully choosing the best words in the art of persuasion. 
So if you are actually going to ask for more money while you're at boarding school, you might do it through a text message, face to face or write a little letter. You would first start by saying your opinion. I need more pocket money when I'm at Urara. Next is your reasons. Your reasons have to be really strong because good reasons are what's going to convince the other person. The first reasons that Miss Dead mentioned were, I want to have more money. Maybe I could buy some shoes and I would have more fun if I had more money. These were not very strong or convincing reasons. Instead, you would write reasons more like the next ones that Miss Deb gave. My reasons for this are so I can buy proper clothes and shoes that are comfortable and aren't going to break. It is also important that I am able to buy everything I need for school. Next is evidence, which is a bit more tricky. You need to state some facts that prove why you think you need more money. You could say something like, My shoes have holes in them. Plus, I only have summer clothes and it is now getting cold. I also have no pencils in my pencil case. You would then finish up by saying your opinion again. That is why I strongly believe I need more pocket money when I'm at Urara. So all together, your persuasive piece would sound like, I need more pocket money when I'm at Urara. My reasons for this are so I can buy proper clothes and shoes that are comfortable and aren't going to break. It is also important I am able to buy everything I need for school. My shoes have holes in them. Plus, I only have summer clothes and it is now getting cold. I also have no pencils in my pencil case. That is why I strongly believe that I need more pocket money when I am at Urara. So does that seem like a convincing argument? And do you think that it would persuade your parent or guardian to give you more money when you are at boarding school? And welcome to another Clontar segment on Urara to you. Some of you have probably already noticed I've got my binoculars again. Last time I had my binoculars, we went racing. And today we go racing again, but this time it's the big one. It's the race that stops an entire nation. Well, an entire boarding school anyway. It's a 2020 Yarrara College, Clontarf Academy Cup. What a class field this is too, with Bomber riding the top weight mophead. Director Dan has picked up the ride on number two, Broomstick. The youngest jockey in the race, Shailen, he'll be riding number three, Pool Q, and the oldest jockey, Stan, riding Paint Roller. What do the tipsters think? So with age and experience, Stan. I think Shailen's going to win it today. He's got the longer legs. I think it might be young Dan here who might win. Don't put it past the old fella. Stan might get up there. He might have a few tricks up his sleeve. Stan. I'm going with Bomber because I reckon Bomber's just going to absolutely blast his way out of the barrier and take it home. The runners are in their handicap starting positions. You get a one metre head start for every year older the jockey is. So Stan, 24 years older than Shailen, that means Paint Roller will get a 24 metre head start over Pool Q with Mophead and Broomstick in the middle of them. Almost ready for a start. Set now. Racing and as expected with the handicap start, Paint Roller in the lead from Mophead, then Broomstick, Pool Q at the tail. Paint Roller leads, Mophead, then Broomstick sweeping around the turn. Pool Q will need a lucky break from there. Stan's gone for the whip on Paint Roller, he's almost fallen over. Mophead flies past to win. Paint Roller second, Pool Q third, then Broomstick. But Mophead cleans up in the cut. Now for the presentations. We have the president of the Arara College Thoroughbred Race Club, Mr. Anthony Gates, to present the cup to Bomber, the winning jockey on Mophead. Congratulations. Good morning. Welcome back to Arara. <laughs> 